Met Virtual Traveller and welcome to Stories from Law, a monthly podcast that invites you to rewild yourself through story by exploring nature, folklore and the stories it inspires. My name is Dawn Nelson and I'm an author and professional storyteller. The dreadful wind and rain is this month's theme and for this episode I have some nature journaling notes for you, a ballad named Windy Old Weather, the folklore of rain, rainbows, fog, mist and storms and I'll be telling the story of the boy who went to the north wind as collected by Asby Jonsson and Mo. But first, let's take a walk across the wintry fields. I'm making my way up the hill towards the end of December. It's been a very, very mild winter this winter. There's a southwesterly wind, so the wind's quite warm too. And I'm watching the birds through the bare branches of the trees. You may have heard the screech of a jay. And above me are two buzzards who are also shouting at each other. For me, those are the sounds of winter. I'm walking along the far end of the field before I head back down across the mud and then through the little bit of woodland that's there. Before I reach the field where all the skylarks are. I've walked this path many times and I've got to know it very well. And I know that this time of year it's usually a bit colder. And so I put my winter coat on. I don't really need it today. Instead of hard earth, the mud sucks at my boots, and makes the walk hard going. The wind is not the usual cold north wind, it's a lazy southwest wind. Certainly not that cold. I'm reliably informed by the Met Office, it's about 13 degrees today. I'm on my walk again at the top of the hill. The wind is colder today and there is a thick fog which hugs the horizon. It's about half past two in the afternoon but you'd think it was nearer sunset. I can't see the sun at all. It's completely hidden in a blanket of clouds and the winter trees a dark against the sky. Crows and the rooks still plunder what they can from the fields. You might be able to hear them occasionally. Standing at the intersection of some fields and hedgerows, there's a good strip across the flat land at the top of the hill here, where the wind can just whip across the top of the fields. It demonstrates quite nicely how important hedgerows are, not just for the wildlife, but 
for the nutrients that are in the topsoil of these fields as well. It stops them all being blown into one field. Or no fields at all even. It has gone from bright blue cold winter day to absolutely chucking it down with rain. The wind at some points is sweeping it almost horizontally. And I'm glad I'm up here in the study looking out the window and not on the school run. We're obsessed with the weather in this country kind of our conversation starter if you like. You won't survive in polite society if you can't talk about the weather. The dreadful wind and rain. The ballad for this episode is a popular sea shanty which involves an array of fish jumping out of the sea to warn the salty sailors on board a ship that a storm is currently brewing. I hope you enjoy it, and you might even recognise it. Be sure to join in if you do. One night we were fishing off Haysborough Light, fishing and trawling all through the night when it's windy old weather, stormy old weather, when the wind blows we'll all pull together. Up jumped the herring, the queen of the sea. He sang out, old skipper, you can't catch me. In this windy old weather, stormy old weather, when the wind blow, we'll all pull together. Up jumped the mackerel with spots on his back. He sang out, old skipper, come square your main tack. In this windy old weather, stormy old weather, when the wind blow, we'll all pull together. Up jumped the crab with his great long claws. He sang out, old skipper, you'll run her ashore in this windy old weather, stormy old weather. When the wind blows, we'll all pull together. Up jumped the rooker, his back hard and tough. He sang out, old skipper, you will burn the duff in this windy old weather, stormy old weather. When the wind blows, we'll all pull together. Up jumped the sprat, the smallest of all. He sang out, old skipper, you will lose your trawl in this windy old weather, stormy old weather. When the wind blows, we'll all pull together. Up jumped the whiting with silvery eyes, said you haven't got long on the sea for to ride in this windy old weather, stormy old weather. When the wind blows, we'll all pull together. Up spoke the skipper, the saying is right, we'll haul up our trawl and we'll go home tonight. In this windy old weather, stormy old weather, when the wind blows we'll all pull together. Windy old weather, stormy old weather, when the wind blows we'll all pull together. This month is a month of my birthday, and as fortune would have it, this year I was gifted a weather station. It is a fine looking thing that is now attached to the chicken coop and tells me everything I could possibly want to know about the weather. Well, okay, maybe not as much as the guys down at the Met Office, but enough for me. Right now, I can tell you that the temperature is a balmy, well, for a UK winter anyway, 8.7 degrees centigrade. The humidity is 89%. The wind speed is gusting at about half a mile an hour in a northerly direction. And the air pressure 
is 1,013 bars, suggesting it's unlikely to rain heavily at least just for now. All in all, it's a very mild day out there. I also have a barometer in the hallway which agrees with the weather station as to the air pressure. But the barometer gives me the added pleasure of being able to tap it and move the little marker hand each time I leave the house. I have always loved observing the weather and when I was younger it was the use of plastic bags made into wind socks, pinwheels and old drinks bottles made into a rain gauge. I love nothing better than a good thunderstorm, never shy away from walking in the rain and, well, the wind itself is full of stories. So what law does the wonderful weather hold for us? Well, for this episode, I'm going to specifically look at rain, fog, mist and storms. So first up, here's rain. Rain is commonplace in the UK. In fact, you could say we're famous for it, and there are many different words and phrases to describe it. In the West Country, that's Devon and Cornwall, mizzle is a word to describe the combination of mist and drizzle, and dimpsy describes fine rain. In Scotland, drik describes a dreary, gloomy day, and drukit means to be soaked through. In Yorkshire, siling describes torrential downpours, and across the sea, huring is the Irish word for chucking it down. There are some ancient ways of predicting whether it will rain or not, and one of the most well-known is whether or not it rains on St Swithin's Day. Each year in the UK, it is said that if it rains on the 15th of July, then it will continue to rain for a further 40 days and 40 nights. If it does not, then it will stay dry. Who's St Thwithens, I hear you ask? Well, St Thwithens was the Bishop of Winchester in the 800s, and it is further thought that the rain in question refers specifically to whether or not it rains on the bridge in Winchester City. So, if you want to know whether it's going to rain for 40 days after the 15th of July, you just need to stand on the bridge in Winchester and see whether it's raining or not. That's Winchester, UK, by the way. In Indonesia, a poor Wang Hai Young, and sorry if I said that incorrectly, is a rain shaman and is still respected and hired to this day for their powers. They keep downpours at bay during the rainy season and are revered for doing this. Of course, once the rain stopped, if it happened at the same time as sunshine, well, then you are likely to get the wonder of science that is a rainbow. This is a meteorological phenomenon occurring when light from the sun reflects through the water of the rain and disperses to create an array of colours. We know the science behind rainbows now, but, well, that wasn't always the case for our ancestors. Rainbows frequently appear in mythology. For example, the Bifrost or Rainbow Bridge of Norse mythology that connects Asgard with Midgard, the rainbow-coloured world snake of the Aboriginal mythology, and of course the rainbow of the Christian faith that God sent after the floods. They would be just to name a few. For the most part, rainbows are considered lucky. However, in the 19th century, they were considered such bad luck that children would lie sticks or straws on the ground in the shape of crosses in order to hurry them away in a tradition called crossing them out. There are certain flowers that it is said that you can use as indicators showing you whether or not it will rain. The Scarlet Pimpernel is known as the poor man's weather glass, as it closes up when it's about to rain. Daisies and chickweed are also said to do the same thing, although for the daisy this may simply be due to the amount of sun present. On rainier days it tends to be cloudier, and as the daisy is the day's eye, it does open up when it's sunny. Oak and ash trees also play their part in weather law, as there are several sayings that suggest if one unfurls its leaves before the other, it will rain. However, these sayings are contradictory. One suggests ash before oak will result in a rainy summer, as it says, when the ash before oak, the summers all soak. Yet another says, oak before ash, all wet and splash. I'll let you decide which is true. All sorts of animals are supposed to predict the weather. Cows sitting down in fields mean rain. Rooks flying low, rain. Seagulls inland, rain. Geese honking, crickets chirping, donkeys braying, frogs croaking and a cat washing itself. Well, that's all rain. To be fair, as I previously mentioned, we do get a lot of rain in the UK. There are, of course, sayings that predict rain too. Rain before seven, fine by eleven. If circle forms around the moon, twill rain soon. 
When leaves turn their back, tis a sign it's going to rain. And there are many, many more. In fact, there's a poem I found in a book called The Countryside Companion, edited by Tom Stevenson. The publication date is unknown, I'm afraid. But this poem pretty much lists most of these indicators for rain. And this is how the poem goes. The hollow winds begin to blow. The clouds look black, the glass is low. Last night the sun went pale to bed, the moon in shadows hid her head. The walls are damp, the ditches smell, closed is a pink-eyed pimpernel. Hark how the chairs and tables crack, old Betty's joints are on the rack. Loud quack the ducks, peacocks cry, the distant hills looking nigh. Puss on the hearth with velvet paws, sits smoothing o'er her whiskered jaws. The glowworms, numerous and bright, illumined the dewy dell last night. Till surely rain, I see with sorrow, our jaunt must be put off tomorrow. Well, that's cleared that up. And if you are like me and still none the wiser as to what might predict rain or not, well, I can't think of a better time to enter the murky world of fog. Not having the foggiest is a common English phrase, which has equally foggy origins. It first appeared as a phrase in the mid-1800s in a newspaper called The Times of India. There is much folklore surrounding the subject of fog, and there are many, many names across the country for this occurrence. Sea fog in particular. In Yorkshire, the type of fog that rolls in off the land from the sea is known as a fret or sea fret. In the north of the country, if it comes in from a northeasterly direction, it is known as a har. And a fog eater is the occurrence of a white bow-shaped cloud in the sky, after which the fog clears, and this was first observed in January 1888. On the Isle of Man, sea fret is called Mananan's cloak. Mananan is the Celtic god of the sea, and he is responsible for the man in the name Isle of Man. Mananan's cloak refers to the impenetrable sea fog that envelops the land from time to time. Islands are often concealed by mist and fog, and Heather Blether is one such mythical island where ethereal men or perhaps fin folk are said to live. And of course there is the Greek island of happiness, the fortunate isles or Elsian fields in the, the Greek mythology, where the heroes go once they have died as they have been given the gift of immortality by the gods. In Irish folklore, the Fieth Fiedda is a mist used by the Tuath de Danann, or fairy folk, which makes them invisible to humans. In Norse mythology, Niflheim itself is a realm of mist and fog, and there is a Valkyrie named Mist, which is reminiscent of the way the Valkyries move across the land to collect the dead who are worthy of Valhalla. In Bulgarian folklore, fog is seen as a woman, often known as Granny Fog. In Dutch folklore, this is also true, and she is known as Wit Wyvern. These are spirits of wise women, and they take the form of dancing, swirling mist and fog that drifts across the lands at night, leading unwitting travellers astray. A little like the -the Will-o'-the-Wisps we have here in the UK above the marshes. You can find out a little bit more about those in Season 2, Episode 3, entitled Lights Above the Marshes. Finally, on the subject of fog, it is thought that if you count the number of fogs that occur in August... Well, then this can protect the number of snowstorms you may have in winter. And so that takes us neatly from fog to storms. Storms are again a regular occurrence on the island of the UK. These days they tend to have names. However, in law, storms have been named in a different way, not alphabetically, but in accordance with when they occur, particularly in the farming year. A cow quaker is a heavy rainstorm in May once the cows have returned to the fields and a lamb blast is an unseasonal snowstorm occurring during lambing season. A gauk storm originates from the Norse language, and it means a fool's storm. This is a very heavy snowstorm that occurs near the beginning of April, or as close to April Fool's Day as it can be. In the Norse mythology, it is the god Thor who brings the storm, and I will talk about this a little more in just a moment. Further afield in Africa, Imkan Yamba, A serpent that lives in waterfalls and lakes will create a summer storm if angered. In nature law, the missile thrush is called a stormcock and it foretells of a storm coming. Gilbert White mentions this in his journals. The idea that a storm hailed the passing of a great person was also a common piece of folklore. 
And another famous diary writer, Samuel Pepys, mentions this in his diaries on the 19th of October 1663. He says, Waked with a very high wind and said to my wife, I pray God I hear not of the death of any great person. This wind is so high, fearing that the Queen might be dead. Whether it was their greatness or the evil deeds that caused the storm depended on the person who had passed. But where does a storm come from? Well, you might think that a storm is when moisture-heavy air meets colder air that's dry and condenses to form clouds. The process creates energy and then once the energy builds to a certain point, it is released through a meteorological phenomenon we know as a storm. However, there are also many gods and goddesses who throughout history have been thought to create these storms. These gods and goddesses exist across the world and in many cultures, but for this episode I'm going to concentrate on the European ones. Thor is a god that many of us will be familiar with, and in fact his name is used in everyday language far more than you might expect, as Thursday was named after the god of thunder. For the Norsemen or Vikings, Thor was his name, and for the Anglo-Saxons it was Thunar. The name Thor itself means thunder, and the wheels of Thor's chariots are thought to be the source of the rumbling. He is said to be able to control the winds, showers and fair weather. If you hear a storm, then Thor is approaching in his chariot pulled by his magical goats, Snarla and Grinder. So now we know where thunder comes from, but where does Thor get the lightning from? Well, Thor is also pretty famous for fighting giants, and one of those giants was Harungnir. Harungnir fought Thor with a whetstone as his weapon of choice. He threw the whetstone at Thor and it shattered. A small piece of the whetstone lodged in Thor's forehead. It is from this piece of whetstone that the lightning sparks whenever there is a storm. In Roman mythology, Jupiter was the sky god and the creator of thunder. He doesn't have anything that creates that thunder, like Thor does. He just simply possesses it. He uses thunder as a weapon, and if there is a storm, then it's likely that Jupiter is annoyed. Interestingly, Jupiter, the planet, is a planet of many storms, and these are lightning storms and have been the subject of much debate. The NASA spacecraft Juno is attempting to research the source of this lightning, and it is currently not apparent to scientists. Of course, the original European god of lightning was not Thor or Jupiter, but was in fact Zeus from the Greek pantheon. He too possesses the power of the storm rather than creating it from something like a whetstone or wheels of his chariot. In both the Greek and Roman mythology, there are, of course, other deities for lightning and other elements of weather. Fulgora was a Roman weather goddess associated with lightning, and Astrape and Bronte were the Greek twin goddesses of lightning. Closer to home, the Celtic god of thunder is thought to be Tyrannus. He seems to bear a very similar resemblance to the previously mentioned gods, as he has a beard, holds a thunderbolt in one hand and a wheel in the other. He's a sort of mashup of Mediterranean and Scandinavian mythology. The wheel is thought to represent the turning of time through day and night, and this is what gives us the indication that he was a sky god. Of course, science shows us that there are other explanations for weather. And indeed, science now shows us that our climate is changing rapidly. And in fact, we are in a situation where we have a climate crisis. We cannot deny this. And recently, I read a book called The Nature of Winter by Jim Crumley, where he talks about what he sees as the disappearance of winter in the highlands of Scotland as our planet gets warmer. Many people have observed the changes Many scientists have observed these changes and are warning us that we need to do something about this. In the UK, we had the warmest New Year's Eve that has been on record. And many of the temporary ice rinks that we have at this time of year melted and made it impossible for people to skate. I'm sure that I am preaching to the converted here. We all know that there is a problem and we need to do our bit. There are many ways you can do this, but I think a good place to start is connecting with the land and the world outside. And you can do this through local charities, such as the National Trust, English Heritage, 
And you can also help those charities that are campaigning to get governments to make the right choices in terms of policy. As you all know, the purpose of this podcast is to help connect us with the land and nature through the lessons of our ancestors and story. And in this way, help us to see how we can do our bit to help the earth. And so, without further ado, I think it's time for a story. And this month's story I have chosen for you is called The Boy Who Went to the North Wind. It's a story collected by two Norwegian story collectors called Asby Jonsson and Mo. There was once a boy who lived with his mother. They were not rich, but they were happy. Summer had not been kind to their small patch of land and they hadn't had the abundance that they had had in previous years and so they had not been able to store the grain and orchard fruits that they had previously. As a result, winter was even harder and now they were down to their last few grains in the store. There was no work for either of them as everybody was suffering the same lack of resources and so had no money to pay them and there was not much else that they could do other than, well, make do. On this particular day, the sky was that crisp satin blue that you only get in the winter. The occasional clouds scudded across the sky, and despite the sunny day outside, the fire inside was far more inviting. Some weeks ago, the mother had made a large stew that they kept adding any leftovers to as they had them. It was supposed to keep them going through the winter, but like I say, it had been some weeks ago now, and the cold, hard ground was not giving way to the new shoots of spring. The stew within the cauldron was more of a water than anything of any substance. And so the mother sent the boy out to the grain store to try and scrape up the last of the corn that they had. He took a small wooden bowl with him. The wood had started to crack on the old faithful pot, but it would still hold a good handful of grain. The boy took the bowl and went out the front door. He turned his collar up on his ragged shirt and shivered his way round the corner of the house to the grain store. Opening the old creaking door, he went into the grain store and used a small brush to scrape up what he could that was left. Opening the grain store door, he went to make his way back into the house, when a wind whipped up and blew away all the grain within the bowl. Never fear, he thought, he was sure he could sweep up a bit more from the grain store, and so he went back in and tried again. This time, the bowl was probably nearly half full. He opened the door slowly so as not to cause a draught to blow away the grain again and he tried to sneak back around the side of the house but the cold north wind blew again and blew all of the grain up out of the bowl. By this point the boy was despairing and when he went back into the grain store he had to work hard to dig away at the corners of the store to find what grain was left in there. This grain was barely worth eating slightly mouldy in places and some of it so hard it was like bullets, possibly from last year. As he left the grain store, he held the bowl tight against his chest, protecting it with his arm. But there was no saving this last meagre bit of grain from the north wind, for it blew again and took with it everything that was left in the bowl. The boy did not know what to do because he could not go back into the house without any grain. He knew his mother would blame him for losing the grain. and When he knew that the true culprit was the north wind... And so it was that he made up his mind to travel to the castle of the North Wind and ask for the grain back. He took nothing with him but the cracked little wooden bowl and he set off along the riverbank towards the forest. Through the fields he walked and over the mountains topped with snow. It had taken him most of the day to get to the frozen lands where the North Wind lived and when he reached the castle of the North Wind, well, he was blue with cold. He slowly lifted his frozen hand and knocked on the big wooden door. The north wind smiled down at him with his bright red cheeks, long grey beard and wild hair and said, Well, hello. Why have you come to my door, little boy? The boy's lips were so cold he could barely speak and so he did what he knew always warmed his heart and he sang to the wind. Oh, the north wind blew my grain away. Oh, the north wind blew. Oh, the north wind blew my grain away. Oh, the dreadful north wind blew. Oh, said the north wind. Well, I can see that you are very hungry. And so to replace your grain, I will give you a magic tablecloth. All you have to do with this tablecloth 
is lay it out wherever you'd like to feast and say to the tablecloth, Lay, tablecloth, lay. The boy could not believe his luck, and so he took the red gingham tablecloth from the north wind, folded it up and placed it in his pocket. He thanked the north wind heartily and hurried back along the path home. Well, of course, it had taken him a long time to get to the castle of the north wind, and so as the short winter day grew to a close, it got dark and colder still. The boy needed somewhere to shelter for the night. So when he stumbled upon a tavern in the woods with bright lights and merry singing from inside, well, of course, he went in. He asked the tavern owner if he may have somewhere to sleep. The owner looked the boy up and down. He had hollow cheeks from hunger and was wearing rags. He clearly had no money. And the owner wondered how he might pay for the amenities. And so he asked. The boy replied that he could pay him with three roast ducks. Well, this was worth a lot of money to the tavern owner and he agreed, not really knowing where this boy was going to conjure these ducks from. But conjure he did, for he threw the tablecloth across one of the tavern tables and called to it, Lay, tablecloth, lay! And there before the tavern owner and all those that were in the tavern that evening appeared the most magnificent feast. Not just three roast ducks, but chickens, roast pig, beef, gravy, bread and small ale, not to mention the desserts of custard and meringues and enormous cakes topped with cream. The tavern owner was most pleased with his payment, but his eyes also saw a further profit. He set the boy up in the most luxurious bedroom in the tavern, which was right next to his own, funnily enough. And then, in the dead of night, he crept into the boy's room as the boy slept. The boy was sleeping with a red check tablecloth tucked under his arm, and the tavern owner carefully slid the magic tablecloth out and replaced it with his very own, very unmagical tablecloth. In the morning, the boy was keen to return home to show his mother the bounty he had recovered from the wind, After all, she would probably be worried. You see, he left without telling her where he was going, didn't he? Indeed, when he did eventually make it back through the forest, through the fields and along the river to the house, well, his mother was worried. And then cross. Very cross. Where have you been, she said. Why did you not bring the grain in? I have been waiting for you all night. The boy explained his journey all the way to the castle of the North Wind and how the North Wind had given him this magical tablecloth and he threw the tablecloth onto their own kitchen table and shouted, Lay, tablecloth, lay! But, of course, nothing came from the tablecloth. Nothing at all. You stupid boy, shouted the mother. You have been conned by the North Wind. Never have I heard such a ridiculous story. I'll I'll show you, mother, I'll show you, he said. I will return today to the north wind and I will tell him that the tablecloth no longer works and that he must give us compensation for the grain that he has blown away. Stupid boy, repeated the mother. And so the boy set out once more, taking nothing with him but the little cracked wooden bowl along the riverbank towards the forest, through the fields he walked and over the mountains topped with snow. It again took him most of the day to get to the frozen lands where the north wind lived, and when he reached the front door of the castle of the north wind, he was again blue with cold. Once more he slowly lifted his frozen hand and knocked on the big wooden door, and once again the north wind, with his bright red cheeks, long grey beard and wild hair, opened the door, looked down at the young boy and said, "'Well, hello again.' "'Why have you come to my door this time, little boy?' And the boy sang. Oh, the north wind blew my grain away. Oh, the north wind blew. Oh, the north wind blew my grain away. Oh, the dreadful north wind blew. But uh, I did give you a tablecloth as compensation, replied the wind. But, sir, the tablecloth no longer works, replied the boy. I see. The north wind was confused, but wanted to make right what had happened. Very well. Then I will give you a sheep. This sheep will poop gold. All you have to do is say poop, sheep, poop, and you will have more riches than you know what to do with. Well, the boy believed the wind more than he could believe his own luck, and so he set off on the path again. The sun began to set, and once more the boy needed to seek shelter. And again he found a tavern in the forest with bright lights and singing voices coming from within it. This time... The tavern owner welcomed him with open arms and offered him a feast on a red checkered tablecloth. When the boy had eaten his fill, 
The tavern owner asked him how he was going to pay for it. And, well, the boy brought in the sheep he had tied up outside. The tavern owner wasn't too pleased about having livestock in his inn. However, he waited to see what might happen. You can imagine his horror when the boy shouted out, Poop, sheep, poop! But I'm sure you can also imagine his delight when the sheep started to poop gold all over the tavern floor. Well, this was truly wondrous. So the tavern owner again gave the boy the best room in the house. And so it was that the boy went to sleep in the same luxurious room. And this time he took the sheep with him, for he was not losing such a valuable asset now that everybody knew what the sheep did. In the night, though, the same thing happened. And the tavern owner, stealthy and sly, crept into the room where the boy slept. He replaced the sheep that pooped gold for a sheep that, well, pooped. In the morning, the boy again returned to his mother. He was determined. He was going to show her how resourceful he had been and how he'd gone all the way to the north wind and how he had come back with such riches. When he brought the sheep into the house, she was horrified, telling him to get that animal out of the kitchen. However, he stayed her words with a raised hand and said, Mother, the sheep is from the north wind and it is as magical as a tablecloth was. I will show you. And he shouted to the sheep, Poop, sheep, poop. The sheep looked at him, and he looked at the sheep, and the sheep let out a long and proceeded to poop all over the kitchen floor. Not poop made of gold, no, poop made of grass and digestive fluids from a sheep's stomach. You stupid boy, shouted the mother once more, this time cuffing him around the ear. You have yet again been conned by the north wind. I cannot believe I have such a stupid son. Take the sheep outside and get out of my sight. The boy did not wait to be asked twice. He did not want another clip around the ear. He took the sheep outside and scratched his head. What could possibly have happened? He set off back to the north wind to ask him why the sheep no longer worked, again taking nothing with him but the little cracked wooden bowl. Along the river bank he walked, towards the forest, through the fields and over the mountains topped with snow. The sun was already beginning to set as he reached the frozen lands of the north wind and he was once more blue with cold as he slowly lifted his aching frozen hand and knocked on the big wooden door of the north wind's castle. A hurly-burly blew and the door opened, the north wind huffing and puffing with cheeks redder than ever, his long grey beard at a rakish angle and his hair truly wild. Never had he had so many disturbances in one week. And as he opened the door, he looked down at the young boy and he said, You again! What now? And of course, the boy sang. Oh, the north wind blew my grain away. Oh, the north wind blew. Oh, the north wind blew my grain away. Oh, the dreadful north wind blew. But I gave you a tablecloth and I gave you a sheep, the wind whistled. But, but they don't work said the boy. How very strange, said the wind, tucking on his beard. Tell me what happened. And so the boy told him the story of the tavern, and how the first time he paid the tavern owner with the food from the tablecloth, and the second time paid him with the gold from the sheep. And now the north wind, well, he saw very clearly what the young boy in his inexperience did not. OK, said the north wind. This time I shall give you a cudgel in a sack, but you must keep it safe, for there will be no more gifts after this one. In order to get the cudgel to work for you, you must open the sack and say beat, stick, beat, and the cudgel will defeat any enemy that stands before you. Thank you, said the young boy to the north wind, and he was just about to turn and go back on his path once more when the north wind called to him again. Just one more thing, young boy. I suggest that tonight you stop at the tavern once more, take a look around with your eyes open wide, and keep that cudgel close. And so it was that the boy journeyed one last time over the snow-capped mountains and through the fields to the forest, where he once more came to the tavern with the bright lights and the singing voices, and he went in. On entering, he made sure he looked carefully as the north wind had told him to, and he found that every table was covered with every type of food imaginable, and the place now had plush velvet cushions on the polished benches, large copper cast and moulded plates on the walls, and many, many horseshoes attached to the big oak beam above the bar. Now he understood what the north wind had been telling him in a roundabout kind of way, 
The tavern owner must have his tablecloth to be able to provide such a feast, and he must still have his sheep as well to be able to afford the luxuries of velvet cushions and copper plates. This time, once the tavern owner had given the boy as much food as he could eat and offered him the finest room in the tavern, when he asked the boy how he could pay, the boy said, There is a big bag over there, and in there you may find your reward. The tavern owner ran across the room to where the sack sat in the corner, and he peered into the sack, wondering what riches it may hold, and the boy shouted, Beat, stick, beat! The cudgel leapt out of the sack and beat the tavern owner until he was black and blue and crying out to the boy to get it to stop. Well, I will, said the boy. I will get it to stop. However, you must promise to return my magic tablecloth and my gold pooping sheep. I will, I will, cried the tavern owner. Just get it to stop. Well, the boy was not without heart and he did get the stick to stop beating the tavern owner eventually. He put the cudgel back into the sack and held the sack tight whilst the tavern owner retrieved the magic tablecloth and the gold pooping sheep. Of course, the boy tested the tablecloth and the sheep before leaving for he was not about to make the same mistake twice. And, as I say, because he had a heart, he left the tavern owner with the food that had come from the tablecloth and with the gold that the sheep had pooped. He journeyed into the night through the forest, through those fields again and along the river bank until, as the sun was just rising, he arrived home. When he entered the house, shouting and hollering about the tablecloth and the sheep and the cudgel, his mother's head was too full of sleep to chastise him, and instead she just stood there, heavy with sleep, in the kitchen, waiting to see what on earth her son was going to do this time. But of course, he laid the tablecloth on the table, and when he said, lay tablecloth lay, there was so much food she thought perhaps she was still dreaming. She pinched herself and discovered that she was well and truly awake, just in time to watch gold pouring out the back end of a sheep. (coughs) Then, When she heard about the cudgel that would protect them from anyone who tried to steal these riches from them, well, she was overjoyed. She ran to the front door, opened it wide and shouted to the sky, Thank you! And, well, I am happy to say, the boy and the mother, the tablecloth, the sheep and the cudgel, all lived happily ever after. I hope you enjoyed this stormy episode. And as you might expect, my love of weather has seeped through into my storytelling in many different ways. You can find an example of this in a story entitled Stormy Weather in my book Adventures in Nature. The activity shows you how to make a little rain gauge and a windsock at home together so that you might bring the story to life. Over on my Patreon this month, amongst other things, there is an easy packed with recipes for a stormy day, weather journaling ideas, folklore and an exclusive bonus story from my New Year show with fellow storyteller Jason Buck. My Patreon is called Rewild Yourself Through Story and is focused on using story to reconnect with the land we live on and the nature within it. You can become a patron to benefit from a range of rewards as I have detailed above. As always you can find me on Instagram as dd underscore storyteller, on Facebook as dd storyteller and on Twitter as dd underscore storyteller. I hope to see you there as I'd love to tell you another story. Until then, I'll see you next time. Toodle pip. <laughs>